Okay, it looks like we are live and on the air, and I am um, Anne Roland Lee, the dietitian for Shar USA, and I want to welcome three bloggers to our Google Hangout. It's um, I'm a newbie on this. This is new and exciting technology for me, and I'm excited to share it. So we have Erin, Reese, and Rosalind with us tonight. So welcome, ladies. Hi, thank you. Hello. Hello. And we thought what we'd do is open up this discussion and kind of, you know, it's fall, it's the weather's changing, it's just a great time of year to bring up some questions that always come up at this time of the year about holiday planning and gluten-free meals and how do you manage things? So, Erin, I'm going to ask you first. Uh, you're, you know, you, we were chatting a little bit before about how you handle some of these holidays. So maybe you can help some of our viewers with some of your tips. Sure. Well, I have celiac disease, and my sister has celiac disease, and her three kids are gluten free. So we've decided for Thanksgiving to do a gluten free meal. It's just easier. Um, we make everything gluten free. Uh, we don't have to make two separate stuffings, two separate turkeys, so we, just to make all of our lives easier and now that we have five of the eight of us gluten free at the Thanksgiving table, we don't have to go crazy in the kitchen on Thanksgiving Day. So um, we do let outside food in sometimes uh, for people that want to eat non-gluten free, but we keep that separate, we keep it off to the side. and. Um, really try to reduce the risk of cross-contact uh, at the table. We really don't like to have gluten at the table at all. So That sounds like a wise idea to really minimize that possibility for cross-contact any way you can. Um, Reese, how about you? I mean, how have you handled holidays? Well, this is going to be our first uh, holiday season where um, I say uh, my mother was just diagnosed and I was just diagnosed um, I wasn't diagnosed last Thanksgiving, so this is going to be our first um, holiday season. And I know a big thing for us has been um, the stuffing of the bird. We love stuffing in the bird, so that that's going to be this is going to be our first year trying to do um, you know gluten-free stuffing. Um, that we haven't really decided how we're going to do it. I'm assuming that we'll probably use char white bread. It seems to make the most um, wise uh, decision making for us so that's what our our plan is um, like Erin I try to keep everything as far away from the table as possible I feel like once it gets on the table the risk for contamination is just too too great so we usually just quarantine um, our non-gluten you know, <laughs> food as far away as we can um, as you can probably hear I have two little ones so it's really hard um, to make sure that they keep their fingers out of any kind of food or off of our plate. So that's, <laughs> that's our big risk control. Well, that's that's true. We found that too, That because um, I'm celiac, my son is, and actually my daughter that's not celiac married someone who is. So we have this mixed family too, but what we've done is the main meal and everything for Thanksgiving is gluten-free. Um, those gluten eaters, we actually segregate to just one end of the table, and there's kind of a, like, almost put a barrier of decorations down there and keep them all separate. That way everyone's together, um, but we do minimize the things that they that they get to bring to the table as well. It's safer for everyone. Rosalind, how about you? Do you have any special tips that you would offer? Um, for us, uh, usually because my kids, they don't have celiac, but they do have wheat allergy, mm -hmm. and two of them are anaphylactic. Oh, wow. So all, yep. So all my relatives, when we have um, Thanksgiving or any parties, we usually host it in our home, mm -hmm. and we prepare everything. Like there's no outside food. Maybe if they want, you know, if we could go to another person's house, like to visit, like the day after Thanksgiving. But usually, that um, everything is prepared at home, and we don't, you know, like we'd say, if they want something else, we say, can you bring wine or, you know, something that the kids will not eat. <laughs> and you, we always appreciate the wine <laughs> after. Absolutely, that was actually when I was thinking about our 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 hangout and our chat tonight. I was thinking about some of the tips that um, 
you know, that I have commonly recommended. And one is that if you can host the meal, it makes it easier because then you really do have control over um, how it's being prepared. And I love giving my guests a list saying, you can bring wine, here are some free products that, that would work great with the meal. I would definitely, you know, be proactive and tell them, you know, how they can help and bring things in, but things that are safe. Um, how do you guys handle being invited out to someone's house? Do you have any special tips on that? Um, I, 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 oh, sorry, Roz. Um, so okay. with my, with dining out, I mean, I've been living with celiac for 33 years, so all of my family and friends know I am gluten-free. Um, usually if I'm going to someone's house, I'll run through the menu with them ahead of time just to understand what is being served. Um, but most of the time I'll offer to bring something. So if, you know, for some holidays, um, I've had friends invite me over for, like for Christmas, uh, Italians have a big fish dinner, and I actually have a shellfish allergy as well as being gluten-free, so oh, okay. usually I offer to prepare something and bring it with me. Um, but I usually am comfortable to talk to, to, talk to the people there um, and tell them what, you know, tell, I ask them what the menu is and also suggest things that I could bring on my own. Right. I think that's a very good idea. Um, one of the things that, you know, I have done and I would recommend that if you're going to someone's house, do, you know, really just be very open and frank that this is, this is medical necessity and that, you know, you're, you would be more than happy to bring Talk to them about how you can complement the dinner, or even I actually a, a you may have to be a good friend, but a good friend of mine. She wanted us to all come to their house, and I was like, "That's great, but how about if I just let you drink wine and I'll cook, and it, then at least you can still kind of have a good control over what's happening in the kitchen." And it it was fun for everyone. It really was. Reese, how about you? I mean, any any thoughts, any worries, or concerns about your first holiday? Yeah, you know it. It's never too hard when you're with people that you know and, you know, trust familiar friends and family. It gets tricky when maybe you're invited out to someone new's, you know, home that you don't really know that well and don't really know you as well. For me, um, in the last year and a half has been kind of hard being open and honest, you know, not being embarrassed. You don't want to put people out and, you know, make yourself feel, you know, special, so to speak, that, you know, you have this allergy. So... You know, like like you guys, I just try and bring something that um, if I go somewhere that I that I personally love, maybe a dessert or fruit, um, you know, something that I could uh, you know enjoy. And sometimes, if I'm really not sure, if I'm not comfortable, I'll I'll eat a full meal, you know, before I leave the house. So um, there is nothing worse than going somewhere and being starving because there's not a single thing for you to eat. So. Uh, you know, I don't, <laughs> I hate being in that position, so that's my really, you know, recommendation for people is just to eat beforehand if you don't know. Well, that, that brings up a very, very good point, is that I think one of the most important um, tips we could offer is that if you're going somewhere, whether it's someone's house, um, a holiday party at work, or even out at the restaurant, to really be prepared. And mm -hmm. I would say that if you're really unsure to... Um, make sure that you know you you know had a snack or something beforehand. Um, um, are we okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, uh, what we were saying is to have something to snack on beforehand. Um, I always have to carry something with me in my bag so that there is something to eat. But then also, you know, I think it's important too to remember that for the holidays, for all these different events. You know, yes, it's fun to enjoy the food and the meal, but really you're there to gather with friends and family. And, you know, I think keeping that in mind is probably one of the most important parts of it, that, you know, you can always go home and have a treat when you get back home. So, Rosalind, any thoughts from you, especially with kids? Yeah, actually with kids, because I have four kids, oh, and wow. we are always invited for parties, like birthdays or nonstop. You know, and all those like holidays, they do have it in school that they have to bring something. Well, what I always do is if we have an event, just like what Reese said, make sure I feed them. Mm -hmm. 
like usually like if it's a dinner I have to give them an early dinner and I always bring something I always tell the host that uh, can I bring dessert usually like those little donuts or something that they could share so what I always do is I maybe I'll bake a dozen or two dozen or sometimes I make like three dozen of those little donuts mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll save like six of them or like eight you know two for each kid on one side and then I'll put the rest on the table so right. that other people can taste it without knowing that it's gluten free or something or you know it, it's also a conversation starter but I already know that the kids have it on one plate for them which right. looks the same as the other kids yeah. and um, so far I had no issues with the parents because um, they are also very concerned about food allergies actually most of them are interested to know about uh, allergies and being gluten free and they would ask me like you know how did I know and it's a good thing that you educate them and at the same time sometimes there were uh, a few moms that they didn't know they had food allergies so we were talking about um, being gluten free, and I said, you know what? It's not just the not just the hives. You can have it in your tummy or something. Go to your gastro. Go to this one and have blood work, and then eventually they'll find out that they were uh, allergic to wheat all these years. And most of them are Italians. Oh no. <laughs> But, uh, but those and are good things. You know, it's a good thing because you know they because they never realize that when we talk about allergies or intolerance, they think about it's just hives. Yeah, yeah, and and, it's, and it you know and now they're like oh after thirty years, <laughs> I didn't know. But uh, I think those are very good tips to you know always be prepared to bring something to share. Especially for kids, it's important that you have things that look like what all the rest of the kids are having so well you know, actually when I think about this not just for kids for adults too it's nice to have something that everyone else is having um, and it's great if you can bring something to, and share that no one even realizes it's gluten free so any other thoughts Erin any thoughts yeah I was just gonna say that I, that's what I like to do I like to bring something um, that people don't know is gluten free and usually my friends would be like wait can you eat that I like to bring something that tastes really good really delicious I'll bake something um, and then people don't even know and and I don't always go out of my way to say it's gluten free because gluten free still sometimes has the stigma that it tastes bad but I think the key is that having it look the same and not having you stand out is is one of the things that I really I, I like to do. I don't I don't want to ostracize anyone and and especially myself. <laughs> yeah. well, we have so many options now of great gluten free items, and um, you know I, I feel the same way. I've often done a dinner party where you just don't say it's gluten free. You just have this marvelous dinner party, and everyone's enjoying it. And when we start taking a bite, or my son takes a bite, they go, oh, "Can you eat that?" And it's like, of course. Um, when he was in yeah. school, I, I he was in marching band, and one of my favorite things was I, I volunteered to be the, the snack mom. So I would bring snacks for every time they had a parade, and we just opened up the Tupperware container, and the kids all enjoyed it. No one had any idea that they were eating gluten-free cookies and cereal bars and things for four years of high school. And I thought, that's, you know, <laughs> I did my job. So what you're saying, Rosalind, is exactly true. You can share these things, and it just, um, it can be delicious. And it makes it much less socially isolating, which is important. Yeah, well, actually, I'll add to that, Anne. A few years ago, when we did that holiday party, uh, the New York City Meetup Group and Char, we had the most beautiful spread of food with breadsticks and meats and cheeses and cookies. And I think anyone who would have walked into that party would never have known it was gluten free. And okay. every single food item at that party was gluten free. So. It can be done. Do that again. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to put that on the calendar, you know. Yeah. So, do you have um, a question? Oh, one of the questions that came in from Twitter um, is how do you do trick or treating? And oh, any. Yes, okay, Rosalind, you're in the midst of it. <laughs> Yeah, I, for me, we do what I always do for trick or treating because um, so far with their food allergies, 
they are not contact. Okay. So this is what I always say if your kids are contact or not. So thank God mine is not mine or not. So we do the normal trick or treating, mm -hmm. which they you know they would get their bags and everything and all dressed up, and then they don't touch the candies. They just drop it in their in their little baskets. Mm -hmm. And then when we get home, I would sort them out. Mm -hmm. So usually it's about like, they, they know it already, they get as much candy as they want, but they don't really eat it. Mm -hmm. We donate the candies to those um, who make care packages for soldiers. Oh, nice. So I have, um, you know, I have those um, treats at home that are safe, like the lollipops that are um, safe for them, the organic ones. So usually they know that we already have those at home, which are their treats. So the treats that are they're getting, it's for the troops overseas. Oh, that's really, that's, that makes it very special, and it lets them participate in something that's even kind of bigger than Halloween. But um, I used to do the same thing. I would bake them their favorite cookies or cupcakes and have those already so that when they would, the kids would come back from trick-or-treating, um, in a way it was a little bit hard because it was only one of my kids, one of the three that um, was diagnosed with celiac, is diagnosed with celiac disease. But we would sort things out and divide it between collected it and sent it to a children's home and, you know, just different things. And the kids liked the idea that they were participating in something that was more important than just getting candy. But they loved you know, the, the fun part of going door to door, dressing up, and collecting it. They just knew that there was better stuff at home to eat than what they collected. So. so one other tip I would send out to um, our listeners, though, also, is that um, all their all different websites, you can get a list of different um, so it's safe and not, so that if you wanted to, keep some of your treasures, that there are, there's hundreds of safe and candy. Uh, any ideas? Are your kids all getting dressed up and getting ready to go out this year? I think we said first. Here you. Oh, uh, Reese, I was just going to ask you what your kids were planning on doing. Um, this year, uh, you got that one? No, go ahead, Reese. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I actually stopped um, getting candy. Um, I don't like having it in the house anymore because if it's something that I can eat, um, I'll eat it all. And um, kind of still need to have candy in the house that I can't eat. So there's tons of options out there, you know, um, pencils, stickers, uh, tattoos, crayons, um, you know, so all kinds of non-candy options. I figured that you know, the kids are going to get tons of candy between school parties and trick-or-treating. So I tried to just do something a little bit different and, and you know, and unique, um, you know, non-candy options. So and they like that just the same. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I saw last year was um, one of the popcorn companies actually did like mini snack bag, snack size bags of the microwave mm -hmm. popcorn. You know, it was a great like single serving. Um, popcorn and totally gluten free, but not quite as you know, a little bit of a safer. Right. Yeah, more next to the snack. So, you want to transition over? Okay, Erin, I actually had a question for you. Um, when we talked about holidays and things, you've been managing this for a long time, and I wonder if you have any um, tips or um, advice for some of our listeners that are really like nav. Navigating the whole social situation for the first time. I'm thinking of kids on first dates. I mean, we talked about the young kids and, and um, trick-or-treating, but what about some of our older listeners that may be facing first dates or school parties or things that may be a little bit more difficult to navigate? Any, any, any suggestions? Sure. Um, well, I will admit it took me a long time to be comfortable with it. Um, it you know, when I was diagnosed in... 1981 and grew up in the 80s and in high school in the 90s, I didn't really know anybody with celiac disease. So um, I just, you know, the fact that we're even having this Google Hangout right now still kind of amazes me because you all know what gluten-free is, you all know what celiac disease is. Um, but I, I do understand there there is this kind of social anxiety that could come, uh, you know, when you have to talk about food. I think it's just 
being able to be your own advocate and, and make sure people understand that you are doing this for a health reason and, and you are not trying to be a difficult eater or, you know, a, a picky first date. You know, this is, this is a medical reason. And I always say to people, just tell people your medicine is food. And, and we really, as a celiac, I, I always, I never took pills. I just controlled my, my disease through eating food and making wise food choices. So I, I totally get it. It definitely is, um, it causes anxiety and you don't want to be, you know, ostracized by your friends or family. But I think just kind of getting comfortable with it, but also making it a, a teaching moment. So if you are at a party and somebody asks you why you can't eat something, you explain to them. And like, you know, like Rosalind was saying before, you might give somebody some information that they never realized and for years they may have been suffering themselves and, and having their own food, you know, um, either food allergies or, or intolerances. So I think if you can flip it on the positive side and, and, you know, really make people understand why you eat the way you eat and, and that you're not suffering really and, and make a positive out of it. And it's really, I know it's easier said than done, but, <laughs> but there's a lot of, um, you'll probably be surprised about the support that you get rather than people that are, you know, thinking you're being difficult. I think you're right, and I think that, you know, using that terminology that, you know, our food is really our medicine. I mean, no one would think twice about someone taking medication for diabetes or hypertension, and we just need to frame it that, you know, this is our medicine, and this is what I need. But I, th I think you're absolutely right that the positive approach is so important. There's so many teachable moments that happen. Um, it's actually kind of a funny story, but how my daughter's now husband got diagnosed was they were dating and he would come over and have dinner with us and feel really great but they would go out and he'd always complain about stomach aches and it was through this that we said well you know maybe you ought to get tested and turns out indeed he was celiac but it was because dating my daughter he found out otherwise he never would have known so you know, there are those funny moments that you can embrace and and make it very positive but I think I would like to if we had like a top five um, things you would tell someone young that's going out for the first time, um, can you come up with like a, a top five list of things you would recommend? Uh, well, if it's a date, I would say recommend a non-food date. <laughs> a walk in the park or a movie or something where you're not socializing over food, even just going for coffee. You know, going to a coffee place, you know, and, and um, Maybe not a bakery that's full of regular food, but you know, go someplace where you're comfortable. And or if you are going on a food date, um, recommend a place that you've been and that you are comfortable. And maybe you know the staff or the manager. Um, and then it doesn't have to be the focus of your topic, you know, your conversation. But top five, I think. I don't know, it might be my personality, but you choose the date, you know, <laughs> like be, be your own advocate, you, you choose where you're going to go and make a suggestion, and most guys will, or, or girls might appreciate that you've gone out of your way to make a suggestion. <laughs> okay. And Reese, how about you, any, any, maybe not the top five, but top couple tips you would, you would share? Um, you know, like Erin said, just, you know, this question, just, just be honest. Um, you know, and don't, you know, like me, I'm trying not to be so embarrassed or, you know, feel, feel like the spotlight's on myself. So, you know, maybe kind of turn the tide and, and not so much make it about you, make it, you know, about, about the situation where you are. Um, just kind of enjoy yourself, kind of not be so stressed out about, you know, the situation that, that you're in if it's, you know, if it's stressful. Um, just kind of enjoy yourself instead of being upset that maybe you are in this situation. Well, I think the recommendation for both of you is to, that one, to be positive and to advocate for yourself is really important. But I think also, you know, we don't, you know, we're all females here, and I think it's, we don't, often don't think of the power we have to say, hey, I want to go to the park or bike riding or something where you can control those aspects. And I think that we need to kind of take charge of that part of our life. Um, mm -hmm. and and, you know, direct 
you know, the dates or the social occasions that way. Um, Rosalind, do you have any tips for kids when you're like, because I'm thinking dating and social things, but what about you know, like wedding, <laughs> you know, and those kind of things? So we'll cover all ages. Mm -hmm. um, usually for the younger kids, I would say, you know, that when they have their play dates. I would always volunteer to be the snack mom as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that they would know, like, it is their house. Sometimes they would say you have a play date in the park or something. I always volunteer to have the snack to share, and then I'll tell them, oh, you could bring the drinks yeah. on that one. And then maybe for the little, not, I would say the older ones, which because I have an 11-year-old now, she still doesn't date, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when she's with her friends, we would always say, you know, um, you can go to our house, or she would always, she knows already to bring, um, you know, to volunteer to bring something, or to do like if they go to a movie, you know, a movie place, she knows she's not gonna eat there anyway because she ate beforehand. Right. Or aside from the parks, or they would go museums now, or the mall, which they don't really eat, they just want to hang out. Yep, so not. I think it's better for like encouraging them to exercise and all those things. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. And I think when we talk about dating and kind of our social lives, it really segues into travel. And um, I know I travel a lot. And it's one of those things that managing you know, a gluten-free diet while traveling you know, it has some of the same pitfalls where you're in different situations. Sometimes you can control and sometimes you can't. And one of the questions that we had come in was, how do you manage? And again, it goes back to what we've said for a lot of these social things is being prepared. I always have um, something in my briefcase that I can eat. I find when I'm traveling by um, by plane, you know, the the airport food is can be very tricky. It's not very nutritious either. So packing your own things is definitely not just a safer way to go, and I think that we, again, need to think of it positively, but it's also a much healthier way to go. So I often will pack my food, take things with me in my suitcase. Never, ever, ever put all of your things in the checked bag because you don't know if your bag is actually going to make it to your destination. So you always have to make sure that you bring things with you. The other thing that I found very useful is local uh, celiac support groups um, and allergy support groups are wonderful to email them ahead of time and actually ask them where are the safe places to eat out, where can you go shopping, so that you land wherever you're going with a wealth of information so that you can say, okay, I know I can eat here, here, and here. And it's not really a date, but often you have business meetings and it's easy to say, well, I found this great restaurant online, let's go here, so that you can really direct it. Because it's really hard to be in those kind of work social situation where um, you need to navigate through a menu carefully. Do you Have you guys faced this or done any traveling where you have some, some tips that you could share? Erin, um, anything? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I actually, traveling is my passion and I write a website called Gluten Free Globe Charter. So um, I do a tremendous amount of research before I travel. And uh, like you said, I, I pack a lot of food. <laughs> I went to Thailand for two weeks last year, and I think half my suitcase was food because I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> but another tip besides the support group, which I've done many times, is just go on Facebook or Twitter and type in the city and celiac or the city and gluten-free, and there's so many resources at, that are out there. And most major cities have many gluten-free bloggers that were celiac bloggers and even small towns and everywhere there are people online and I find um, those people are great resources. I went to Wales and Scotland in October and I connected with a girl that wrote a blog in Wales and she told me which bakeries to go to, which restaurants to go to and it was such a great resource and it was first-hand experience so I, I valued that, that she was celiac, I was celiac and she gave me some great recommendations. That's actually a very good point because I think we often, in the social aspect, think about you know trying to navigate this alone. But when you reach out and make those connections, you realize you we have a wealth of support as long as we feel comfortable enough to reach out. Because I've been in 
grocery stores and restaurants and people say, oh, I get it, I understand. And it, it makes it so much more comfortable and you know you're not alone. You're not facing this on your own, which is important. Um, any other tips, ladies? Reese, any ideas? Um, well, you know, I'm the only one in my immediate household who, um, you know, needs to eat gluten-free. So when we travel, I always feel like, you know, like a burden if we're on the road, you know. But now I just speak up and, you know, I know where I can eat um, fast food with certain places where I can get items. I do, do research, um, definitely find out what's on the way, what's around, what you can eat. And something else that I that I found out um, is don't don't assume that your um, maybe if you get get an item at a local supermarket in your area that that same supermarket um, in another area is going to have those same items. Mm -hmm. um, traveled to Little Beach um, last summer, and I get a lot of um, you know pretzels and other items at the Walmart, my local Walmart here in New Jersey. Um, but when we travel to South Carolina. The same items were not to be found, so I was really unprepared, and I was really hungry. Um, we were with a large group of, of our family, and it was really hard for me, um, you know, to find things to eat without, you know, being being upset. So definitely do your research, and you know, like Erin said, just pack your food. So that's what I do now. I pack, you know, snacks, fruit, and um, you know, my my husband always laughs at me when we travel. He says I'm. I'm always eating, but I feel like I'm almost like a chipmunk, you know. I kind of want to pack it all in, you know, just in case, you know, you know, dinner time comes. There's no option for me, so yeah. That's what no, thank you all. Those are great tips, really, to to be prepared, bring things with you, and do your research ahead. But actually, a lot of that too, um, Reese, when you talked about that, things are different in different places. It makes me think of the new gluten-free labeling law as well, because. Um, you know, it, it passed and, you know, that was enacted in August. And I think that although it's, we all kind of read the nice sigh of relief that we now have a law that regulates what is and is not gluten free, there's some wiggle room in the law that um, not everything is, is created equal in the world of gluten free. And I think that's something that, um, I don't know if you, if you ladies have any special thoughts on it, but. I know from a manufacturing point of view, I think the, the law leaves, um, is a little weaker than I had thought it, or had hoped it would be. And not everything labeled gluten-free may actually be completely safe. And I think we need to be very careful and really look for you know, good certifications and testing. Any thoughts or concerns on your part on this? Um, it's, you know, my my biggest thing being gluten-free since the moment I found out about being gluten-free was just to read, read the labels no matter what um, because there are a lot of hidden things that I know I didn't know um, you know from the very beginning you know, I was still getting sick and I couldn't figure out why and then I realized things like modified food starch and other little things that you just don't know where, where it's hiding and um, so no matter what it's labeled, read the ingredients and you know, make sure you know. I I tell people um, who have questions if you cannot pronounce it, and if you don't know what the ingredient is, don't eat it because it's not worth um, you know getting sick over it. And uh, just stick to something simple if you don't know what you know what the ingredients are. Rosalind, any thoughts from your from from your perspective in terms of kids with that, with anaphylactic allergies? Actually, that's um, I'm I'm very concerned about it because um, like like with them um, with the gluten free like sometimes they would say it's gluten free but in a certain degree I think it's not like totally hundred percent like with the labeling so my issues here is not you know since they're anaphylactic I really have to make sure that in the ingredient list it is not there and also the facility. Right. Which is sometimes until now I think uh, most uh, most labels they don't really they don't really specify if if the facility also handles wheat or other kinds of gluten because sometimes they would say uh, they would label it for wheat that the facility handled wheat but then they wouldn't tell you if they handled barley or rye or other things 
which is also gluten and which also can cause uh, a reaction. You bring up a great point because um, with the new labeling law, the, the, the new gluten-free labeling law specifies that for something to be labeled gluten-free, it has to be tested and be under 20 parts per million, which is great. But the testing is up to the manufacturer, the monitoring is up to the manufacturer, and the choosing of which test is also up to the manufacturer. But one really important thing that um, is often overlooked is those advisory statements, those may contain and all of that, those are voluntary. Those are not required to be on any packaging. And that's why we see a big difference between different brands and different packaging, because all that is a voluntary statement. The other thing that happens is that the law covers foods that are, are regulated by FDA. And those foods are different than those foods regulated by USDA. So FDA foods are your fruits, your vegetables, your, your canned goods that do not have protein in them. USDA covers your meat, fish, and po your meat, poultry, and um, eggs. That was it. I was like, there's third. Fish is totally regulated by a separate one. Now, what's important is that modified food starch by FDA standards is corn, but not necessarily by USDA standards. And that's where it can get really confusing that depending on who regulates the food you're looking at, the package you're looking at, the labeling can be very, very different. And that can be a, a whole source of confusion. The good news is that, as you said, the ingredients have to be clear. And um, if there's wheat, rye, or barley in the ingredients, it has to be listed there. Um, whether it's made in the same facility, as we said, is that voluntary statement. But I think that the more people are aware, the more we'll find that manufacturers, for the most part, really do want to do the right thing and will disclose it. I would also advocate for calling. Um, calling a company and asking them to make sure that things are, are safe. Karen, any thoughts from your end on, because you've seen this change from having no labeling or gluten-free to a wealth of different certifications and a labeling law and allergy statements, so. Yeah, it's definitely confusing. <laughs> um, but I actually had a question. At, yeah. With the labeling, um, one of my favorite things to do is go to farmer's markets. And I was wondering if the labels on products at a farmer's market are covered under the labeling laws. The, any product that is going to be sold and has the, um, a label on it should be meeting those standards. It should follow those standards. So that if they're going to label something for sale, and a farmer's market's kind of a, uh, it's not really a usual retail, right. um, but if they're labeling it, it should be covered. But I would say, because you're right there and you can talk to the person, ask. And the questions to ask are, do they test their ingredients before they, they make something? You know, are they making sure those ingredients are safe? Um, what else is made in the facility? Um, you know, is it a shared facility where they use it one day, someone else uses it the next day, so that you have to be careful, or is there shared equipment? The other thing I always worry about, too, is what are the employee practices? Is there a separate place where the employees eat from where they manufacture? Now, again, you know, in most manufacturing facilities, that's all regulated and it must be separate. But if you're talking about small mom and pop places, it may be gluten-free ingredients, gluten-free equipment, but if their son John comes home from Subway and is in the same kitchen, you, you could potentially have cross-contamination. So there's a lot of questions to ask. Yeah. But I will highlight, I love the idea of the farmer's market because there's so many naturally gluten-free foods that are available and are just a, a wealth of nutrition that we should not overlook either. You know, all our great gluten-free grains, all of our fruits and vegetables, you know, I think we can really have a, a really, uh, uh, a diet that's not only lush with nutrients, but lush with flavors and things, too, by using naturally gluten-free foods. So, any thoughts, ladies? Um, there's a question coming in. Oh, ask about un any unexpected foods with gluten. Any, any, anything that you have found that you were surprised at that contained gluten? 
Erin, go ahead, start. Oh, well, I would say I actually wanted to hear what Risa had to say, because I just feel like I've known for so long, but I wonder if somebody that's newly diagnosed, if there were things that they're surprised about. Reese, what, what are your thoughts? What surprised you most? Um, I never actually thought to look in things like sauces. Um, like, and I'm not talking about, you know, like maybe like a gravy, um, but maybe things like barbecue sauce. Um, for a long time, I was making a rib recipe, and I was getting so sick afterwards, and I could not figure out why. And then finally it dawned on me it was the barbecue sauce that I was using. Um, so, you know, again, that after things like that started happening, I just started checking the labels. Um, another thing, uh, Twizzlers. I love having Twizzlers when I go to the movies. And never would have dreamt on me, you know, dreamt that, that Twizzlers had gluten in it. So, and I was always, again, sick as a dog after the movies. I thought I was just eating too much popcorn, too much candy. But it's Twizzlers, so, yeah. I would have to concur. I think Twizzlers was one of the things that surprised me most as well. That you would never think of me being in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a licorice. Um, the other food that always kind of surprises me as well, and I have been doing this for a while, is when you look at your salad dressings and something that seems as plain as a balsamic vinaigrette and you find wheat flour in it always, always makes me just wonder, you know, why we have so many ingredients in a lot of our food. So um, I'm trying to think if there's any other. Um, any other foods that would really, or um, lotions or things that you were surprised at, Reese? Um, you know, I um, after we went to the, the gluten free expo last month, I that was actually the first time that I ever thought to look in my chapsticks or my lotions or shampoos. I, I have to be completely honest with you; that was something that I had completely overlooked. Um, so I met a lot of different vendors who, who were selling items, you know, and highlighting that as a quality. So, um, you know, I've kind of been taking a look now at the ingredients of, you know, my different toiletries and body washes and, and different items. I never, never even thought that to be an issue. But probably, probably partly because my issues always had to do with the stomach. Um, you know, maybe because, you know, with your children, you know, getting rashes or high, you know, that's something that... You know, probably thought of, but I never thought about that. Point, Reese, um, because I think that we often don't think about all those topical things, but um, one of the things that surprised me, and I, I hadn't thought of it um, at first, was sun, sunblock, because you're oh, laughing yeah. everywhere, and you're at the beach, and you're not really at a place where you're going to be able to wash your hands. Right. And I've had people say, but you don't eat the sunblock or the shampoo, and I'm going to toss this to, to Roslyn because I know kids lick their feet, they drink their bath water, so how do you handle, you know, all these lotions and, and topical things with your kids? Yeah, actually that's the first thing, because I had one child with eczema for nine years. Mm. And we never, you know, we always get like the steroids and everything. And then eventually we realized, or we found out after nine years, that she got wheat allergy. Oh, my so goodness. It's, so it's like everything, and it's just within two weeks of removing everything, like even the laundry detergent has wheat. Mm -hmm. oh it's God. just crazy. So, like, those little things. So uh, when I had that one, and I said, it, she's allergic to it, so everything, like the Play-Doh that they use at home has wheat on it so I from now on you know since then I started reading every label especially um, those little things whatever we have at home right. and and it's weird because even some of aside from the topical things like the fruit juice some of them had wheat on it oh. or other gluten yeah. And it's like an ordinary brand that we drink that it's juice. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Why would they need a thickener for the juice? Yeah. So usually I would stick to things that are, I would say, more natural because you don't have the complicated words on it. You don't need to research what it is. So if it says 
this is the ingredient, I know right away that it is wheat, not a scientific name. So it helps me out a lot. And also for the makeup. Because, I mean, they don't do makeup, but I love makeup. <laughs> and I realize that just being close to them, like the lipstick or the foundation, when I give them a kiss or I hug them, I already contaminate them with gluten. Yes. So I, I've decided to start looking on those things, and everything helped. Because before, when, you know, every little detail helps in their health. And I've seen the difference once I removed everything. Then it, and that's an important thing because they're a contact and it, it is that, that skin um, reaction that for, for you then that would be very different. For someone with celiac disease, gluten has to be ingested. But you know, if you're touching things and they're, they're touching your face, I mean, it can easily go into their mouth. So any other suggestions or are you ladies um, Ready to wrap up, or any? Do we have any other questions from our viewers that we need to, to touch base? Erin, any any closing thoughts? Um, no, it's uh, it's interesting because only did the topical come into my brain <laughs> in the past few years. I remember when I um, was little and I had the chicken pox. My mom would always give me a bath with that oatmeal soap, yes. and I actually have a really bad reaction to oats now even gluten-free oats so really I have scars like from 30 years ago of chicken pox because I was scratching so hard but it wasn't even the chicken pox that was causing me to itch it was the oats that was causing me to itch so um, I, I think reading the labels is so important and I don't want people to be overwhelmed it mm -hmm. gets easier because you become familiar with the brands and the, the, the foods that are gluten-free or the products that are gluten-free and and you'll find out what's right for you and I think I always try to tell people that it does it's super overwhelming at the beginning but it, it will become like a second nature to you and and you just learn I mean you have to learn to adapt and it, if it's not wheat it's something else so <laughs> good very good points uh, Risa any any closing thought and then I'll wrap us all up and we'll be good to go yeah, you know, just like, you know, Erin said, it does, it does definitely get easier. You know, I'm, I'm much more comfortable now than I was, you know, 18 months ago. Um, and just be prepared and, you know, just continue to enjoy your life and be positive about it. You know, if you're not, I know for myself, I'm not in pain anymore. You know, I, I can, I enjoy my life so much more now because I don't have that pain and, and that stress. So, you know, it, just focus on that, you know, in your life. Good point. And Rosalind, a last, last thought for you? or Yeah, last thought. Actually, I think an important uh, reminder is because gluten-free has become a really uh, fad, diet fad nowadays. Um, before they would try to do the diet, I would suggest to, have, to go to a doctor, either to an allergist or to a gastro because some of them they would like self-medicate and then they would start saying oh I, I went gluten-free and I didn't get healed because like with allergies sometimes it's not the gluten that you're allergic to it's something else and Point. which makes it um, and they would say oh it didn't work and then they would start saying bad things about gluten-free and um, also another important thing that I would like to point out is, uh, you know, just enjoy. I mean, it's, we're not aliens. <laughs> and, you know, because like they would say like, oh, what, you're gluten-free, you're on this diet, you should be skinny or this one. Um, oh, and one important, and the last thing is just because we're gluten-free doesn't mean we are healthy because I've seen a lot of packaged food and some people would say we're gluten free but then they they didn't lose weight or they gained like 50 pounds yeah. and I say did you ever eat normal like uh, fruits and vegetables or you just ate all the gluten free that's labeled from a package very good point very good point so I think that you know all of you brought up some great points one yes you need to see a doctor and get tested before you start doing gluten free and as we started with is gluten-free is 
uh, is a fad for some people, but for many of us, it's our medicine. And when you think of your medicine, it should be good, whole, natural food. So if we focus on those kind of things, it's, um, it is really a healthy diet. Um, and we need to, you know, to, I guess if I were to put our thoughts in kind of just a, a couple capsules is that we really do need to stay positive. And gluten-free is a healthy choice and a medical necessity for us, but that doesn't mean we don't enjoy our food and enjoy our life. But that means we need to ask questions, we need to advocate for ourselves, and we need to connect. So in thinking about connecting, I want to make sure that you ladies all post your blog sites so that the viewers can um, link to you and find you and get you know be able to reach out and touch you because I think that social connection is so important for support for all of us. Um, and with that, I and oh, in the shark club. Sorry, I'm getting little tidbits from the side. So we also have a shark club, which is um, another place that people can connect. Just go to www.shark.com and join the shark club. There's recipes you can link with these ladies and get a wealth of information. And um, first, me, thank you for helping me through my first Google Hangout, and it was a ton of fun. So I appreciate it and. Um, Thanks to our viewers and thanks to our wonderful bloggers. Couldn't have done this without you. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and good night.